<laughs> but the point you're arguing is a little different one. How much, how much value is destroyed by bridges to nowhere, uh, by $600 toilet seats, by, by overprinting dollars? Government destroys and destroys value in a whole set of array. I think we should be very, I'm an equal opportunity critic of government. All of the areas where government is distorting problems do in fact make us a poorer or less free society. The Fed, because it's in a, in a has been a sacred cow, not, oh, and Phil, really, until 10 years ago, the only people criticizing the Fed were a handful of what most people thought were cranks. Criticism of the Fed now is a mainstream occupation. So in that sense, America is closer to a resolution of those than we were 10 years ago, the, unfortunately. Well, four trillion is an awfully big spigot. And uh, and this is new and novel because they were, this is just a new thing that they thought that they had the right to start printing money before they could bring down interest rates to 0% or a quarter of 1%. But uh, now they want to go, and uh, next thing you'll know, they'll be buying refrigerators and houses and whatever, besides uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Your point is, is that <laughs> the power of the Fed is vastly greater than it once was. That's certainly true. But in all honesty, the power of every government agency is vastly powerful than it was before. The power, true. the power, the, and it's not just the official power of agencies. The government now, as a matter of fact, the Fed, Agencies now are doing things that no one thought were in their charter of powers. The, um, we're having things, regulations of course, reinterpretation of the regulations, executive orders, guidance documents, sue and settle settlements. We have created a, a government that is essentially we need, the ones who want more government don't need to do anything. Government now is big enough so it's growing on itself. The power of government agencies so out of control that if no new laws were passed, no new regulations were passed, one could see government still growing in its current rate. It's metastasized. And the Federal Reserve is part of that metastasization process. Absolutely, and uh, the president can decide uh, whether to enforce this part of the law or not part, change the, the law and do it on his own. Anybody challenges him judicially, it takes three years to go to the Supreme Court. So he can do what he wants. Remember, this is <laughs> this is why our our founders created separation of powers. Right. One but group to make the laws, another group to administer the laws, and a third group to adjudicate whether they met the restrictions that the Constitution imposed. Let's go back to the All economic. Broken down, as you know. Yeah. Uh, Let's go back to the economic consequences of printing extra money and creating inflation. Uh, when you create inflation, is that a disincentive to save? Well, it could, it could not be. It depends very much. Uh, you know, uh, the way people normally say is, if you were on an island and clamshells were used as a medium exchange, and one night you flew over and doubled the supply of clamshells on the island, if you were naive and didn't know that, then there would be all kinds of weird effects. Uh, people would be buying, thinking things they could no longer afford and buying too much of it. But if everybody woke up the next morning and said, all of your clamshells are halved, conceivably nothing would happen. But all of that is in a small economy where the information as to the new money supply was instantaneous. In the real world, that would not be possible. And so the money illusion would be distorting decisions on all sides. Too much. Some people would be seemingly rich, some would be seemingly poor. So you cannot... An, an inflationary economy in the real world will have major costs and they cannot be overcome by information because that information can't be disseminated to all the parties that are, are going to respond to that inflation. But there is a disincentive to save if every day your, your dollars are worth less, right? If you save them, then the next year they're going to be worth but the, less. But, well, you know, uh, what know. happened in Argentina? The people well, yes, start course. to go to, to buy whatever goods they can and because if they well, hold the money in their pockets... With hyperinflation, that's certainly the case. It's been the case. It was the case in Germany. It's the case in Argentina. But with 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 the normal kind of... Normal. With the kind of inflation we've sort of thought was reasonable, 3%, 2% a year, uh, people don't change very much because, sure, they could buy the refrigerator a little earlier, but a 3% change over one year is not different. If you look over 10 years, it probably does move the purchase of the refrigerator up a little sooner. Uh, people would say, 
people would save more otherwise. It might be on the margin, but they would save more otherwise. Yeah, there'd be a marginal change. Right. The big things, I think, are going to be the ones who are the sophisticated buyers and savers. So companies if, if will spend more today. They will borrow more today. Uh, yeah, well, they will try to sell more today. Yeah, those are all things that will vary. Although, Does, remember, companies can adjust their pricing behavior to account for inflation more than you and I can for our consumption value. Well, it's not worth our time. It makes it pretty much. Does economic growth depend on savings? Uh, if there are no savings, will there be any capital available to invest? Well, look, this is an area I'm very interested in. I think the, I know the answer you want is yeah. there won't be, but I don't think that's true. I think okay. there are, in our society, especially in the information world we're living in, many of the innovations do not require very much capital. Um, and so as a result, the capital needs of investment are less now than they used to be. And you've got to be careful because if you believe in we need savings, then you lead to government, industrial policy, and so on down the line. Frankly, I think to the extent capital is needed for innovation and for entrepreneurship, it will be found under any regime because people... If there are savings, but if there are no savings, people don't have the time to experiment and invent well, things and do things. They need, they need to have somebody save in order for there to be capital. There has to be less consumption and somebody has to not consume Yes, they have to save. But, but, but look, a society, right. even those of us who are spendthrifts, don't spend that money instantaneously. Between the time we get our paycheck and waste it on the bar or whatever, we have that period. I don't, th I don't think that savings, of course you need savings and so on down the line, but I think the saving, sa I think savings are not the, dr the most important part of encouraging innovation. There are the important part of encouraging expansion and stability and things like that. If you think of industry as starting out low and then becoming larger over time, in that seed corn period, you don't need much soil. You don't need much corn to do it. I mean, the innovators, you know, the, 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 during the Olympics, there was that interesting ad by Cadillac, I think. It started in a garage and so on down the line. A lot of great inventions start in garage. The capital requirements are important, but they're not, in my view, the, uh, the major factor in stimulating or shrinking the ability to have an innovative dynamic society. But <laughs> it, it is true that you cannot have capital investment if you don't have any savings. No, no of course not. But